Okay. okay. Hello, Hello to, to everyone, everyone following uh, this event. So, so good morning to our friends from uh, uh, US and uh, Latin America continent and uh, Australia and so on, or um, good day for the Europeans. And uh, I'm not sure about other time zones, but it's a great pleasure that we gathered for this event um, during, during the, the festival, festival Arts and Human Rights, Rights. Uh, this, uh, this festival, festival is produced and organized by Dark Theater in, in Belgrade, Belgrade, in Serbia, and, and this is the day three of the festival, which is going very well, and it consists of the um, uh, live events and online events, so I'm very glad that many of you can follow us online. It's my uh, uh, a big pleasure to present today's speakers, and uh, these are uh, Cynthia Cohen, Polly Walker, and Claudia Bernardi, and in a few seconds I will tell a little bit more about them, but for now I to say uh, welcome and thank you, thank you, thank you that you are taking part in this conversation. Um, this event uh, features impact, and uh, we, we would like to talk about what uh, impact platform is, and uh, also uh, we shall have the presentation of the work of Claudia Bernardi that is closely linked to the ideas and practices of impact, uh, uh, and I will tell in a while about each of our guests today, but impact goes for the platform for art, culture, and conflict transformation, and it is a worldwide values-driven collaboration to design and activate strategies to strengthen the art, culture, and conflict transformation ecosystem. And what is its ecosystem, and why do we call it ecosystem? We shall going to talk in a while. So, as I said, we have a, a great pleasure that we are having Cynthia Cohen with us. Cynthia Cohen is a professor and director of the program in Peace Building and the Arts. She leads research projects, writes and teaches about work at the nexus of the arts, culture, justice and peace. She directed the Brandeis University Theatre Without Borders collaboration Acting Together, co-edited the Acting Together on the World Stage Anthology and co-created the related documentary in Toolkit. She was the founding director of the Oral History Center in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and has facilitated coexistence efforts involving participants from the Middle East, the United States, Central America, and Sri Lanka. And Cynthia is also uh, at the heart of impact. Uh, Polly Walker, another part of the heart of the impact, is um, uh, serves as the director of the Baker Institute for Peace and Conflict Studies and the Elizabeth Evans uh, Baker Professor of Peace and Conflict Studies at Juniata College in Pennsylvania. Her research and practice focuses on the role of the arts and culture work in transforming conflict, indigenous set settler conflict transformation, and indigenous research. She is co-editor of the two-volume anthology Acting Together, contributor to the film acting together on the world stage. She currently serves as the liaison between the Peace and Justice Studies Association and the International Peace Research Association. Polio is of Cherokee uh, descent and a member of the Cherokee Southwest Township and chair of the Indigenous Education Institute. So, wow. Uh, incredible guest. And I will just present Claudia, even that she will talk a little bit after. Claudia Bernardi, socially engaged and community-based artist, printmaker and installation artist whose art work is impacted by the effects of war and political violence. Born in Argentina, Bernardi endured the military junta that caused 30,000 desaparecidos missing people. Bernardi participated with the uh, Argentine Forensic Anthropology team in exhumations uh, investigating human rights violations against civilians. This experience impacted her commitment to community arts. In 2005, Bernardi created the School of Art in Turkin, El Salvador, a community-based art project, replicated in many different car uh, 
uh, countries and uh, about that project and other projects we are going to hear in a while. So we should start with um, uh, Cynthia and uh, po uh, Polly, and I would like uh, to ask you to, to talk together about, first of all, uh, how impact uh, was initiated, what was the seed of impact, and I think because, of course, I know the stories that uh, our audience would be delighted to hear it. Okay. Diana, can the audience see us? Yes. yes. Okay. Audience. And we she, can't see the audience, but they can no, see us. No. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. So, I would just begin briefly by saying that the idea for impact grew out of the initiative acting together on the world stage. And that collaboration between Theatre Without Borders and Brandeis um, involved theatre artists doing community-based work and artist-based work and also people engaged in rituals in documenting examples of how the performances of different kinds can contribute to the creative transformation of conflict. And one of the things that we noticed was that people from different parts of the world and people balancing the, the, their commitment to aesthetic quality and to social transformation grappled with that balance in different ways. And they were very keen on understanding each other's approach to, that, to those questions. And um, Polly and I and others involved with acting together came to realize that it wasn't enough to have these conversations happen just when there happened to be a project or we happened to find each other as, at a conference, but that this field of arts and culture and conflict transformation needed an infrastructure. So I'll turn this over to Polly to talk more about what that is and her impressions of how it started. I'm, I'm going to back up just a little bit from the infrastructure to, I would say, conceptual model or maybe a beginning theory. Um, as Cindy and Roberto and I began to work with the multiple very talented curators of the different chapters, or as we call them, cases, and the Acting Together anthology, we, we were doing grounded research. We were looking at what's everyone around the world who's involved in this work and who's contributed to this volume, what are they finding that are important themes in terms of building sustainable peace, of justice, of developing more nuanced identities, or restoring identities that have been um, disrupted by violence. And we started to build all of these themes and we became very aware of being able to clearly articulate the power of the arts and cultural work in transforming conflict. And at that same time, we're also very aware that the power of the arts and cultural work can be used to exacerbate violence, to justify genocide, to build people's willingness up to engage in that. And we realized we need to articulate something more within this work other than the power of the arts. Yes, the power of the arts. And and we found to be quite effective in, in saying how is the power of the arts directed in the direction of justice and peace. We found it effective to use John Paul Lederach's four basic principles of the moral imagination. That was engaging with paradox or paradoxical curiosity the willingness to risk moving beyond the known violence into the mystery of peace, making space for the creative act, which obviously arts are very well suited to, and the fourth and no, centrality oh, of relationships. relationships. That's it. I always can remember three and not the fourth one, uh, the focus on relationships that we are all interrelated and that the well-being of our grandchildren is dependent on the well-being of the grandchildren of the opponent of what we perceive to be enemies. So we realize the power of the arts can be directed in the service of violence or peace. And we found this framework to be quite helpful in our work, say, being able to articulate how this work is moving in the direction of conflict transformation. Hmm. We discovered in doing the Acting Together project that there were 
people working in zones of violent conflict and doing work that we would consider to be peace building work who really didn't yet think of themselves as peace builders. And I think Diana, maybe you were among that group and um, who didn't even had never heard of um, John Paul Lederach's idea of the moral imagination. So, and, and like I was shocked that there were people who were working with refugees from war whose countries were in, in processes of transitional justice who had never even heard of the term transitional justice. That might be the case for some people here. So we felt that the field itself needs strengthening. Um, like the people from the peace building world need to understand more about the, the reality and the potential, the, the real transformative power and the potential transformative power of the arts. And people from the arts and world of arts and culture would, be, would benefit from being more aware of theory and practice from the peace building world. And, you know, we kind of carved out this um, set of practices and set of people and organizations and theories and put them together as a, a, and named it to be a field of arts, culture, and conflict transformation, starting with performance, but then extending out to other arts forms as well. Um, and as we, well, to pick up from what it, where I spoke last to say that there need to be some structures that support this work, that, that the contribution, when I say there need to be, what I mean is that the contributions of arts and culture in contexts where violence is happening or people are recovering from violence or people are trying to prevent the outbreak of direct violence, but still dealing with a lot of oppression and structural issue, structurally violent issues, that um, that work could be strengthened the contributions could be even more than they are if the field were being supported in various ways, including having people from different regions of the world be in communication with each other and having opportunities to learn tools and resources. So um, when I say that there needs to be an infrastructure for the field, it's it, what I mean is that it needs to be, it, that the contributions could be even greater if there were these kinds of support. And um, the idea for, we, we talk, uh, Acting Together published in 2011, and it took us four or five years to like throw out this idea to the world and say, yes, <laughs> we need this infrastructure. And it wasn't until about 2016, 2017, that we got some uptake, I mean, significant uptake from the Mellon Foundation that supported a planning process for an infrastructure for this field. Can so. I just uh, jump in and ask you, you mentioned the field and you both are coming from the world of academia also, although you're also, I mean, doing a lot of practical work. Uh, it's obviously you explain why it is important to, to become a field. What does it take that this um, new kind of the area that you are working in or we are working in together, arts and conflict transformation, peace building, enters as the field into an academic world? So maybe, Polly, you can mm -hmm. say something about that. Yeah, and, and once again, as I want to be, I'll back up a little bit and then come back into the focus. I think we see this work both as an ecosystem and as a field and that the ecosystem and the field overlap because the ecosystem is um, you know, self-evolving, emergent. There are people all over the world doing this work coming in and maybe moving back out again. The field is an attempt to bring some, some kind of a flexible fluid framework to this work so that we can funnel resources from funders, from donors, from the global north to the global south um, it, with that defining of the field that makes it more understandable, say, for instance, in relationship to your conference with human rights, how do we articulate within that field how this work is related to human rights? How can we articulate to donors and funders 
the efficacy of this work. Um, how can we share with other academics why it's important to disrupt the hegemony of academia in, in terms of the really powerful and effective work that's being done at the grassroots level and to build those kinds of collaborations that you and I talked about um, when we were sitting together in Banff, that the next step must be <laughs> the actual collaborations and projects between artists and conflict transformation specialists. So I think the boundaries of this field, we hope them to see, we hope to see them firm enough so that policymakers and funders, academics and people that, and artists understand what they are and how they can access them or contribute to them, but also realizing that we're a part of this much larger ecosystem that is self-emergent. Let me just jump in and add, um that in order for any of us involved in this work, whether we're artists or cultural workers and community leaders or funders or policymakers or, or scholars and researchers, actually to do our best work, we need each other. We are truly interdependent. And some, we may not always recognize that, but that's one of the main ideas that impact, which is you know the Imagining Together platform it's a platform that we are envisioning and beginning to make real that you know funders, policymakers, artists, and academics and others can um, be in conversation with all different sources of knowledge being valued. So I think when we started out this idea, yes, it was um, maybe had scholarship at the core. Um, that it was going to be based, we even thought about a university-based structure that had some solidity and stability. And then as we started to work on it, we realized that that actually was perpetuating a kind of hierarchy that wasn't going to lead to the real, true strengthening of the field. And that artists and, and policymakers and funders and community leaders need to be at the table as as projects are being framed, as questions are being defined and asked and answered. And one of the big challenges, therefore, is to have these different ways of knowing come into generative relationship, even though we talk in different vocabularies and maybe some people do embodied work, some people do more intellectual work, but how can we value each other's ways of knowing for the benefit of our communities? Um, and, and to meet the big challenges of global warming and global inequalities, this trend toward authoritarianism, these major challenges that the world is facing need all of us to be collaborating together. And that's, that's our kind of vision. Beautiful. Yes, thank you. And I know that many people are interested to somehow become the part of IMPACT. And I know that this is one of the ongoing conversation because also I'm part of IMPACT. So, but I will ask you now, as I don't know, uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, both of you, uh, if someone asks me, like I have like a friend and collaborators asking me, how can we become the part of IMPACT? What is the way? <laughs> Well, <laughs> um, I'll start, Polly, you can jump in. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, we're, impact is figuring out really a structure for participation and membership, because right now it just has a leadership circle of like 15 or 16 people. But there are some ways to get involved. And I, I mean, perhaps one really good starting point is to subscribe to an e-newsletter that comes out of Brandeis that's called Peace Building in the Arts Now. And I can put in the chat a URL for how people can sign up for that. And that has, right now, that's the vehicle that Impact reports out to the world what it's doing. And we'll make announcements there of events that people could join like webinars or learning exchanges. So that's, the right now, those are the best ways. I think, Polly, do you wanna add anything? No, I think that's that's the best. We're in the process right now of reevaluating the structure of impact and creating one that we hope will support and strengthen the field um, in a really sustainable manner. But I think linking to that newsletter because we'll have some upcoming learning exchanges 
And if people want to become involved in those, they run for two days around the globe. We have sets of facilitators that take up you know, for an hour or two, and then someone else picks up in the next time zone, at exploring questions that are of particular relevance in that moment, and sometimes region specific. We just recently finished a learning exchange in Africa. So that's one way that they can become involved is by joining one of those learning exchanges and they'll learn about the upcoming ones through that newsletter. Maybe I could just add one more thing, which is um, that uh, Impact has produced two major reports summarizing our research into the needs of the field. And I will also add the URLs to those two reports um, into the chat. And also, it's possible for people anywhere to just take up this idea and engage, define conversations or events that they want to have in their region or in the, with their sub interest in refugees, let's say, or in work in prisons or some other aspect. So you're welcome to initiate some, some impact initiatives. One thing I would love to see us do is to find better ways to find each other and communicate with each other. Um, when Cindy and I had finished working with Roberto and, and you, Diana, and others on acting together, we had attended, a, on many of us, a range of conferences around the world. And we were always coming into other artists, peace builders working in this field, and none of us knew about each other's work. So we were hoping that impact would help to address that. I'm still finding, even though impact has been in, in the, at least the design phase for several years and uh, initial practice phase, as I, you mentioned, I sit on the board of the International Peace Research Association Conference and we're planning an online version of our conference due to COVID. And there are people who've never heard of impact or acting together and I've never heard of their work. So there's a, we need, we all need a way to find each other so that we can learn from each other and support each other. And that's, I'm hoping that impact can continue to strengthen that aspect of the ecosystem. Uh, I think you said a great um, thing, and this is that we need to collaborate together. This is something that is um, going on as a thread through all our conversation during this festival. Yesterday we were in conversation with the Irish artist, and it was incredible how many things just echo. Like we are speaking here after yesterday's conversation, but obviously there is this big need of uh, collaboration because we all understood by now that we can't transform uh, our communities, our societies alone or just through one field that we need to be together. So togetherness, collaboration, care are some concepts that are, that are very present during this festival. And I think this is something that also impact promotes. And just for the end of this first circle, I would like, uh, I would uh, ask you, Cindy, just to tell us a little bit of concrete example of activities of impact. So we were speaking about learning exchanges. Can you tell us about the brilliant idea of thinking partners? Mm. Yes. Um, so the thinking partners idea emerged from a conversation among several impact people about how we could play some role in relation to the um, to what artists were experiencing from in, in, in because of the COVID pandemic. And we realized that a lot of artists have lost their opportunity to earn fun or to earn money because they aren't getting any gigs. And we decided that one modest thing we could do was to partner with the Buffer Fringe Festival, which is in Cyprus, and um, to um, support the, uh, the artist. There were seven artists in, or ensembles selected to work, to be part of that festival. And we could sort of support them a little bit financially to create their work, not just to present it, but to have some resources to, to, to support their creative process and also to support them by partnering them with thought partners, with people who can um, deepen their reflection on their practice, deepen their understanding of the, the real and potential connections of their work to conflict transformation principles. And so each of these artists or ensembles has now been paired with thought partners who have been meeting with each other, you know, over the over several months to um, learn from each other, 
and uh, to bring the kind of um, perspective of impact into this into the creative processes that are informing this festival. Diana, I think you're involved as a thought partner and I'm not at all. So you may want to add something to what I said. I am. Um, and I, I found it as really fantastic idea. Um, uh, I'm serving as the thinking partner to the Volke art group from Thessaloniki, uh, Greece. And uh, it's an amazing process because the thinking partnership transcends idea of mentorship. It is something for me like another level because uh, we are really, as we are doing it in impact of thinking together. And this is uh, the concept that is very needed, I think, in our times. And uh, this is something that uh, we are using uh, as well in this thinking, uh, thinking partnership uh, process. We are benefiting on both sides and we are really exchanging uh, ideas. Of course, the topic is the new work of the group that uh, uh, I'm a thought partner to, but um, uh, we, uh, I'm giving my uh, thoughts, ideas, they're offering theirs. And it's really the process of, uh, in a way, a part of thinking together in a way of kind of creating together. Of course, they're creating their body of work but um, uh, it's also I'm cre creating my body of thinking. And mm -hmm. so I think uh, uh, this is something that is really fascinating uh, in comparison with traditional mentorship, which is fine. But mentorship um, uh, basically implies that there is the mentor that in a way has more experience, has more this or more that. Thinking partnership is more, it's completely on the, let's say, equal basis. We are just uh, partners in crime, let's say, <laughs> crime of art, thinking together and supporting the practices and the works of each other. So I found it uh, as, a, as a beautiful concept. So uh, thank you for this first circle. We shall come back to, I have uh, so many questions for you, of course. And, um, but now I would like to ask Claudia to talk a bit, of course, about her work. Claudia, you're uh, a first of all, visual artist. So I would ask you a very simple question. Why did you as a visual artist uh, started to work in the realm of the human rights peace building, conflict resolution, transformation, and so on, because uh, many visual artists that I know today uh, are thinking, okay, my art is my art. It should not come into politics. It should not be influenced by the other things that are happening. And you put yourself and your art in the middle of the uh, world affairs. So why did it happen? Uh, thank you, Diana, for the question. And what a pleasure to be with Cindy and with Polly. Thank you. It's wonderful to hear you talk about impact, of which I didn't know. <laughs> so I'm one of the artists that I would like to learn more. In regards to your question, uh, Diana, I think it is very important to remember that I'm from Argentina and that I am part of the generation that was hugely affected by the military junta. So I think as a young Argentine woman, thinker and, and artist, it, it seemed to be unavoidable to be impacted by what was going on. And the art somehow was uh, a response to what we were seeing, right? So it's interesting what you bring this question about political arts, whether it is an intention of the artist or not. I usually like to phrase my answer by saying that I am part of a generation that was hugely impacted by political events that could not be avoided. But I think in regards of the work outside my own studio, which is what I will present, um, my life was rerouted when I work in El Salvador. And that's what I am going to be presenting about because it was a, a very direct contact with the effects of violations of human rights that were different than what I had experienced in Argentina. And also in regards to what Polly and Cynthia have 
express and also your work. It was an opportunity to learn the history from the victim's point of view and not only to make it uh, graspable or available through reading history or reading, re reading reports, which of course is very, very important because that constitutes a way to build history. But the work in El Salvador and since El Salvador has given me the opportunity as a visual artist to intersect in the field of art and human rights, working with people who are survivors of political violence. And it is their story, the ones that are being said, are being um, represented and rendered through art projects. Thank you. And can you tell us a bit more about your work? And I know that you have this amazing project, Walls of Hope. So yeah, and this is what we are going to see right now. <laughs> so can I share the, the yes, please. screen? Okay. Okay. Hopefully all this will work. This is always the... <laughs> the challenge. Okay. All right. And we are seeing it, right? Okay. Yes. So um, my presentation is called um, Arts Against Brutality. And as I said briefly, my work changed a lot after being in El Salvador. So I like to present here a, a brief information about where is El Salvador in terms of location. And um, it's the smallest country in Central America. From 1980 to 1992, El Salvador in face um, the civil war that left an enormous amount of evidence of violations of human rights, more than one million and a half people dead, 200,000 people disappear, more than one million people exiled. Uh, I'm needless to say, this is a very short visit. But what I like to point out is that the war ended in January of um, 1992 through a political agreement. The peace accords were signed in Chapultepec, Mexico, um, having as a recognition that the two parts of the war, the army and the government of El Salvador and the guerrilla armed forces Farabundo Martí Liberation National Front were accepting the end of the conflict and they were also accepting the creation of the United Nations Truth Commission that had as its mandate to investigate violations of human rights. Now there are many massacres in El Salvador during this period, but the Truth Commission decided to investigate the massacre at El Mozote in the north of Murasan for two main reasons, because of the scale of the numbers of victims, which is over 1,000, and also because the whole investigation was open upon one single testimony, which was the testimony of the only survivor of the massacre. So here we are uh, arriving to the place. The United Nations Truth Commission nominated the Argentine Forensic Anthropology Team to carry on the exhumation at El Mozote. And as we started working at the site, we realized that, as Rufina had said, there, there was evidence of violations of human rights against civilians. There were a lot of people inside the building we were exhuming. But something that was not known even to Rufina, the majority of the people we were finding were very, very young. So this is the outcome of the information of the Argentine forensic team, recognizing that the allegation of mass murder against civilians was confirmed. And what we were finding in that building was the presence of at least 143 human remains of which 136 were children under the age of 12 with an average age of six years of age. So um, after working in this exhumation for four months and when the exhumation ended, I came back to the United States where I reside with only one question I couldn't answer, which is what can I do? 
¿qué puedo hacer yo? I mean, apart from being part of the team, and, you know, the, the human rights reports was very scrupulous, and it gave a lot of information, etc. But on a personal journey, what is what I can do as an artist? And because I am an artist, the work started becoming... Uh, very connected to the experience, very much a way to remember what I had seen, these images that had uh, presence and absence at the same time. It was the first time I started working with installations and the little garments became part of the rendering of the theme. You know, the finding over and over again, small garments was something that had impacted my perception as, a, as an artist. Uh, one of those installations I brought to that theater in 2003 was called Color of Time. I think it's Boya Bremena, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, once again, the presence of that which is being said and that which is not, which is uh, in, an interesting dilemma about what the community remembers, how the community remembers that. But it was not until 2005 that the answer of what can I do was resolved by finally going to Morazan, very close to where El Mosote was, in fact, four kilometers north from where the massacre place is. And there is where I founded the project called Walls of Hope, which is a community arts project of art, education, human rights, and, uh, and community building in Perkin. Perkin is the community. Uh, oh, sorry, and I like to say that this is a project that I share with three wonderful local artists and dear friends, Sisters of the Heart, America Argentina Vaquerano Romero, Rosita del Carmen Argueta and Claudia Berenice Flores Escolero, we are the artists of, of Walls of Hope. So let's see. Ellas quemaron a la gente, le pusieron fuego a la casa y se vinieron a matar a los niños. Los niños los mataron por la noche. Yo, yo escuchaba, pero no crean que es fácil escuchar que los niños, los hijos de uno estén muriendo y no pueden hacer nada. Pues. of either joining the combatants or you had the choice of fleeing because the army came in here and was pretty much killing anybody who looked indigenous. So you could either fight back or you could leave. Those were your choices. I am talking about a community that survived a war of 12 years. Perkin, le dicen la capital de los guerrilleros. Este, gente bastante humilde y se caracteriza por eso, por ser una colonia de excombatientes. Cuando se llega ahí y se le pregunta a cualquier persona de los que viven ahí, le va a contar una experiencia de los que han tenido de la guerra. El arte juega un papel importante en esto, en mantener en los pueblos y en las sociedades o en las nuevas generaciones memoria, memoria histórica. In the year 2001, the mayor and the leaders of the community asked if we could create a school of art. <laughs> the school of art was not my vision. Emphatically, this was the vision of the community, and exactly because of that is so powerful. Printmaking classes 
drawing classes, jewelry classes, photography classes, video classes, everything that we artists can produce as an offering the community takes. El interés que hay, incluso de personas que vienen de otros municipios, es también grande. Hacen un esfuerzo, un sacrificio para estar acá, ¿verdad? Porque quieren aprender y porque no hay en otros sitios un espacio donde podamos recoger estas expresiones. We have a community of people that believe dearly that art matters. El arte nos reúne a todos en en una manera tan espontánea, tan bonita, una vivencia tan bonita y donde todos nos sentimos que sí sabemos hacer muchas cosas y que podemos hacerlas. Cuando yo veo las obras que he podido, obras de arte que he podido realizar, me siento una persona con, con dignidad. Y esto es importante, superar la baja autoestima que la gente pobre a veces eh, tiene. El arte me parece en todo este contexto sumamente importante porque es una manera de reconciliarnos con nosotros mismos y de reconciliarnos después del conflicto con la demás gente. Estamos tratando de expresar lo que sentimos o lo que pensamos de eso que pasó. Es a través del arte, es a través de una fotografía, es a través de una canción, es a través de una pintura que tú puedes educar a la nueva generación. En primer lugar, para que nunca jamás se vuelva a dar una guerra entre nosotros, en nuestro país. Tenemos que hablar de esto para que no se vuelva a repetir. Tú no miras todo. Hay algo más que no se ve. Hay que buscarlo, hay que... Y, es, y ese es el papel del arte. Buscar algo más de lo que nuestros ojos alcanzan a ver. So, that in a summary is what Walls of Hope is. Uh, when we started this project, we didn't have a plan, we didn't have a way to imagine how it would grow. We mostly were listening to the community and to the community's needs. As, as I said in the brief video you saw, for me it was amazing that in a, in a period so damaged, uh, so close to the war, they wanted a school of art. They made that a priority. So we started learning about how we would do this in other places. And one aspect that we really cherish is that we do not go to the communities until we are invited to come. So that is part of an amazing network uh, of possibilities. But we started traveling in 2007 to Guatemala to work with survivors of massacres in different projects. We work also in Huehuetenango with 32 women who were survivors of sexual violence during the armed conflict. This was the first time that the artists brought the idea of making a mural movable and that they initiated the possibility of making this on a canvas so the mural could travel. And I'm making this, uh, I highlight this vignette because we are really learning with the communities more than being artists that come with an agenda. Um, in the case of these women of Huehuetenango, this mural, uh, as the women said, it's a book of history without words. And this particular mural became part of a trial against the perpetrators who had caused the sexual violence against the women and became part of this first uh, space to justice, the, the Tribunal for Consciousness Against Sexual Violence in Guatemala. So for us, it has been an, a wonderful opportunity to see how art can become or becomes a lot more than just a powerful or beautiful image. We have worked in Ciudad Juarez, Mexico, a place that suffers the effect of femicides. 
In the year 2013, we work with 50 students from a high school, different high school actually, concentrated in one. They were all related to the victims of the femicides in Ciudad Juarez. This was a, an invitation from the International Red Cross and the Mexican Red Cross. And it was a way to learn how the victims, the young, uh, family members of the victims of the femicides were remembering or were understanding violence in Ciudad Juarez. Um, in 2016, we have moved from El Salvador to Colombia. We are now finding a new nest in Colombia. And by total coincidence, because it was not our planning, but we arrived to Colombia at the very same time that the peace accords were being signed after 15, 52 years of war between the FARC, the Fuerzas Armadas Revolucionarias de Colombia and the government of Colombia and the army of Colombia. The peace accords were signed um, in September. And this brought Colombia to a very unique moment. Uh, and we, once again, by total coincidence, because it was not delivered on our part, but we arrived to Colombia, to the north of Colombia, close to Cartagena, working in adjacency to an agency called Seeding Peace, Sembrando Paz, that has a long history of community building in the area. So they embrace our work in the arts to start working with indigenous communities, mostly Senu communities in that area and with Afro-Colombian communities that were coming back to the north of Colombia to reclaim their land. All these people are people who had been exiles, forced exiles during the 52 years of war. Once again, what the murals are is a visual rendering of how the victims see their history. Most murals have past, present and future. And uh, it is their past, present and future, what they are talking about. Many of these murals are traveling inside rural areas, very apart areas in Colombia in order to uh, present the opportunity for other participants to be part of these projects. The last mural we painted in August of last year was between ex-combatants of the guerrilla armed forces and civilian population who are victims of the violence inflicted by FARC. So, um, the Walls of Hope keep on expanding. We have worked in Canada with Inuit people. We have worked in Colombia, El Salvador, Guatemala, Argentina, Northern Ireland, in Germany, in Switzerland with forced exile people that were seeking uh, political asylum. So our work continues to be impacted by the history, recent history of violations of human rights and political violence. So this is what I like to present today. Thank you. I'm over one minute from the 15. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. You're amazing about keeping the time. And uh, thank you very much for this um, beautiful presentation. Claudia, I know your work, your visual artwork, and I am always deeply touched by its beauty, first of all and then by the depth and what is it uh, causing in the spectator. But I can say you're educated artist. You studied art, you're doing it all your life and so on. And uh, I saw the murals you made with community and you told me that uh, very often people who painted the murals never painted before. Yeah, and the murals true. are truly beautiful. And uh, I, I was always uh, really moved by the uh, beauty of the murals that are not always only beautiful, but they're of course speaking about tragedies and atrocities and keeping the memory and doing all this, but it is a great art. And then it completely shifts my way of seeing what is uh, amateur art and what is community art. So, uh, these people were and are that you somehow 
um, that you work with, somehow you, you make them artists. So can you tell me about that? Yeah, uh, thank you, Diana, for that question. I think that's one of the most uh, requiring questions about how is it possible for people who have never done art come together in a relatively short period because you know it's about exactly. you know the average the average time we spend in each project is between one and two weeks uh, seldom it is three weeks so um, just for clarification the the chicas my wonderful friends and collaborators in this project and I, we never touch the mural, we never suggest anything. The whole process evolves around having conversations first and then having a moment to share drawings and ideas. And we have a choreography that we continue to repeat, but it is by reinforcing the possibility of remembering through visual. Now, it, as you said, in this presentation, for instance, the, the majority of the people who were participants of this project in Guatemala, they have never even seen a brush. There is a, a beautiful vignette in which Doña Elena from uh, Nebach, looking at what she was doing with the brush, she said, the brush is like a candle. It has light on one end. And I said, ay, Doña Elena, que cosa maravillosa. Yes, this is beautiful. I will repeat this many times that I will always give you credit. So yeah, that's Doña Elena from Nebach. Many people, and the, the people we are working right now in Colombia have never done art, have never seen art of this scale. Then, you know, the mural is also challenging because it's big. We only give two very standardized questions. Is this mural going to have past, present, and future? And if, if it is going to have past, present, and future, where do you put the past, the present, and the future? And that's the beginning of how they have to come together to an agreement of how they are going to remember. Basically, that strategy of visual arts, it's a tool for the community to start thinking about how are they going to remember? Where are, you, where are they placing the past, present, and future? And from there, you know, there's a lot of uh, drawing at first, and then very frequently there are um, the ideas that are repeated. So we create subgroups of people that are working on the same idea. And then we start working on the piece itself, which is, you know, what you saw briefly. In terms of the capacity of creating art that is beautiful, that is to me simultaneously a, continue, a continuous surprise and celebration and very humbling in, in that, that everyone can do it, right? It's, it's recurrent that they find a way to figure out how they wanna present it. We are facilitators. So for instance, something that they may say, you know, I don't know how to paint water. How do I paint a river? So we create sub uh, workshops. We have, okay, let's have a river committee. And then when we have the river committee, then we sit around and say, look, these are some ways in, in which, you know, we can see how painting can be rendered. And then there are many options. And of course, from that initial uh, first, river committee, what they end up doing is completely different, but it is one, one moment of having a conversation that needs more attention. Same thing about sometimes how a person is being rendered. So we have a human, human body uh, subcommittee and we start working on that. But what is always beautiful to see is that at the time they actually work on their piece they find their way and whatever we have said in the little workshop is information that they gather but they don't rely upon and yet they are very very beautiful all of them are and a moment which is always incredibly moving to me is to see them when they see the mural finish because there's a moment in which the mural can get overdone. So our role is saying, okay, let's take a step back and see maybe you are very close to the ending of the piece. And when that happens, it's so beautiful. You know, they are, they are moved. They are very frequently moved and 
um, celebratory and thankful. And it's really powerful when the mural is painted by people who have fought the war from different sides, right? Yeah. Uh, the mural is something they have in common. So we didn't know this at first. We are learning as we go. But what, what I can say about these community art projects is that are definitely an opportunity to create a dialogue that was not there before. So it's, um, it's a very humble possibility for diplomacy, something that may open a conversation further. And you know, this, this might take a long, long time. One step forward, three backwards, but we take the step forward through the murals. Exactly. Uh, what I'm thinking about right now is that, and of course, this is why, uh, why I invited you to this presentation, although that you are not officially part of Impact, you're at the heart of Impact's uh, work, because this is exactly what Impact is trying to and is achieving to connect people coming from different fields and artists to work together. And in the project Walls of Hope, you needed to connect with the community leaders, with forensic anthropologists, with the social workers, and so on and so on and so on to create this incredible uh, art that um, really served to transform conflict uh, for conflict resolution, for transcending the tragedy into something um, that can make life uh, to go on. So thank you, Claudia, thank very you. much. And we'll have one more shorter circle and hear about another amazing project you are doing. I would like to ask actually both Polly and Cindy, but uh, Cindy will get a little advantage because um, I will ask the same question, but uh, uh, first to Polly, so Cindy can <laughs> think about it. Um, uh, and there are also specific uh, elements. Um, Polly, you're coming from uh, Cherokee also origin, and uh, you're deeply aware of the uh, division between the, uh, the indigenous communities in the United States and the, uh, let's say, white uh, community or white settlers. We are hearing uh, these days a lot about the whole movement, anti-racist movement, uh, Black Lives Matter. Uh, we know that you are just uh, in front of elections and uh, we know how deeply the United States is divided society today and that people are in pain on both sides and of course uh, this is not the case only in the United States but uh, since you're coming from there and this is so now urgent situation there what do you think that art could do in this situation that other fields could not do is a very challenging question and I will do my best to answer it, because as I hear, the question is about um, addressing decolonization in just ways, or the colonization of indigenous peoples, addressing the enslavement of peoples from Africa, and expressing the, the rising polarization within the United States and globally, and the violence that people are willing to engage in. And, and I think there are many things that the arts can do. I think a lot of this polarization um, starts out with with rhetoric with um, linear arguments and then people get emotionally attached to them uh, or the emotions get aroused by them I think the arts have a role of disrupting all of those solidities of bringing all of us into a liminal space where we can explore different identities maybe we're watching some of say some of the beautiful murals that Claudia just displayed and knowing that people from both sides of a conflict came together to create them. We have a space where we can imagine ourselves differently, perhaps here in the United States in relation to someone we're, whose views we're very opposed to, say around statues of Christopher Columbus, you know, who in, in many of our perspectives was a genocideer. It, it opens up spaces to try on new identities, to grapple with new, Thoughts And I think also to, to seek commonalities, which are really difficult to seek 
um, I can imagine the commonalities in the work where Claudia just discussed are bringing together people from both sides of this conflict and the kind of polarization in the, you see in the United States right now, it doesn't feel very safe when you're just talking to, to say or to explore what you might have in common. But through the arts, you can search for those, even just that basic common humanity. You know, we are all interrelated. And if we move against, you know, other people within our own country to destroy them, whether they're, you know, indigenous peoples, people who've been enslaved, descendants of enslaved peoples, or people from an opposite side of a political spectrum, we destroy our own societies, we destroy our own lands, we destroy those political, economic, social, and spiritual connections that we depend on. So I, th I think the arts can create this space, you know, kind of liminal space for us to grapple with these issues, to look at them in more nuanced ways. And again, then it opens up that possibility for finding ways to transform them. Thank you very much. I'm asking this also because I'm interested in this question since I hear it very often. Yesterday at the festival, we had the debate and uh, the debate was, the title was, how can art uh, uh, and other fields together uh, create the change in society? And one of the speaker claimed that art cannot change the society. And in a way, it, of course, it provoked uh, me and provoked us. And it was a very good debate, very good um, conversation, because uh, we here deeply believe that, and you just said it very eloquently, how arts could influence the positive transformation of the society because uh, people very often want it very quick that they want to change very quickly they want change uh, instant they want to see and there is some other aspects of the art uh, that is very unique and that is not always uh, so obvious and so quick but then it really creates like a deep, deep change. So Cindy, I would like to uh, hear your thoughts on this. Okay. Um, I guess I take as a starting point that engaging with the arts is a way of apprehending the world, of understanding the world and of acting on the world. I think about these challenges that we're facing in educational terms. Like what do we need to learn about ourselves? What do we need to learn about each other? And what capacities do we need to build a more just, more vibrant, more peaceful world? Sometimes we have to recognize that those capacities may have been impaired by violence itself. The fear, the rage, that we feel often make it difficult for us to listen deeply to each other for good reason, but the arts can create a space for that kind of listening, listening and being present to the painful experiences of each other's suffering. Um, because the arts, the beauty of artistic work revitalizes us or vitalizes, it gives us vitality. And whereas what we have to face may be very depressing and sad and, you know, um, diminishing our energy, the artistic, the artfulness of the creation um, lifts us, lifts our spirits and reminds us of the creative capacity and possibility of, of us as human beings. Also, the capacity to imagine something different is something that often is difficult after decades or even centuries, as we've experienced in the US, centuries of oppression and um, assaults on the dignity of our, on our dignity as people, let's say of indigenous communities or minority communities. And I think there's something about engaging with the arts that restores human dignity because it engages us in the most important thing, which is to make meaning out of our experiences. And um, so I think um, if we think about arts and cultural work and cultural approaches as 
first of all, you know, engaging us, our senses, our cognition, our emotions, sometimes our spiritual lives at the same time. That interanimation of these parts of us, the way we're engaged is very um, energizing. And so I think, um, yeah, I think these are some of the things. I'll just say one more thing, which is that, you know, the art symbol communicates different meanings to different people. And the meaning of an artistic expression is a transaction between the artwork and the one who beholds or witnesses it. Even if that person who beholds or witnesses it is the creator. But um, for this reason, the precise meaning of, of an artistic expression is, is ambiguous to some extent. And that ambiguity allows the artwork to reach deeply within people because they're constructing the meaning and also broadly throughout societies. Um, and that's, th these are some of the reasons why I feel the arts are, can be, cra can be crafted to help us really engage constructively with the biggest challenges that you mentioned, Diana. And I think it's important to remember um, that not all artwork does this. Some artwork is very damaging and reinforces power imbalances or can re-traumatize communities or can promote an ideology that's, uh, or impose a culture, uh, uh, like let's say a Western culture on, an in, on a local community. So the ethics behind what happens in this arena are really important. And we have to take care not to, uh, not, we have to take care to minimize the risks of harm that can happen in doing this work. Wow, so that was like a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Thank you very much for this and thank you for introducing ethics because this is exactly what we need also to um, to open up uh, uh, as like uh, the, the space for discussion that art is not always just, <coughs> sorry, would be beautiful. <coughs> so, <coughs> hmm. Claudia, <coughs> can you go on, please? Yes. <laughs> Time for for a, a a glass of water. Okay. So thank you. Uh, and so briefly what i'd like to say is that this uh, briefer presentation acknowledges the work that the chicas and i have been doing uh, within the criminal justice system in the united states do you see the image yes yes yeah okay great so i call this presentation unspoken words steps on sounds because uh, in, I, I think the, the stories of the undocumented unaccompanied Central American minors that are detained in the United States are vastly unknown or insufficiently spoken about. Um, so once again, I'd like you to be introduced to the US-Mexico border. And this is one part of the wall that divides the US from Mexico. This is one of the projects that President Trump wanted to continue building, making the wall bigger, mightier, more difficult to climb, etc. Uh, and you know, who are the people that are coming here and why are they coming? That's a big part of a conversation that we may have later. But uh, who are these people? The people that are coming are from Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, Mexico, a lot less from Nicaragua. There are people from Nicaragua, but vastly the great uh, majority of people coming here are from El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. So they start their journey by crossing by foot, whatever you know, country they are coming from. And then when they are at the very south of Mexico in Arriaga or Ixtapec, they take this train that they call La Bestia, the beast. And there's not only one train, there are many trains that go from Arriaga or Ixtapec all the way to the US-Mexico border, but they are all called the beast because 
the, the traveling is very dangerous, it's perilous, people get killed, people get raped, um, people are being pushed away, there's a lot of violence. Many people make it, many others do not. So one wonders, you know, why is it that these people keep on making this journey? And what they say is that they are escaping violence. Now, the majority of the people that I met through this project, they are all minors. They said recurrently that they are escaping narco cartels in their countries and then they are trapping the narco cartels at the US-Mexico border. Okay, if they manage to cross, the majority of them say that they actually give themselves up to the border patrol's authority because they feel, perhaps correctly, that they would be safer within the United States criminal justice system than outside of it. But of course, they don't understand what the United States criminal justice system is. So these people are people who are here because there are not options in their countries. They are poor. They have been victims themselves of their families of violence, the drug cartel, narco-traffic, etc. And uh, as I said, when they come in, they have to face what the US criminal justice system is saying. Since the Trump administration, the restrictions for people to come into the United States have been a lot more severe. So I wanna share one vignette of many that says that in the year 2018, the United States lost track of 1,475 migrant children. That is the response to the fact that within the Trump administration, when a family would come in and detained by the border patrol, the parents would be put in a center of detention and the children would be placed in another center of detention. So the children and the parents got track of each other. And in very recent, maybe within the last two weeks, we have learned that over 500 kids have completely got disengaged from their parents because their parents were deported. So this is clearly a case of violations of human rights against children. There's undisputably a case of violation of human rights against children. So for the last seven years, the Chicas and I have been working within the criminal justice system, which has not been easy. And, uh, but we have been invited year after year. So this is wonderful. And we have been working with undocumented unaccompanied Central American minors. So I like to start with a poem called Marriage. Yesterday in my cell, my pal asked me, man, don't you want to marry life forever? And I answer, why marry life if I can't divorce death? This is a poem written by a 16 year old Honduran uh, person in prison. So I'm choosing to show only one of the seven murals uh, to give you an idea of how we work. The mural was so large that we had to do it in two parts as a diptych, and it was created by 57 boys and girls, or all of them undocumented and accompanied Central American migrant minors incarcerated in a maximum security mm -hmm. prison in the US. So, in the same way that you saw people working in Guatemala, working in El Salvador, working in Colombia, we depart from drawings and ideas and then everyone paints together. And in the same way that this fabulous uh, artist from Huehuetenango were saying, the mural is a book of history without words. These murals are very potent books of history that are telling a story that they saw. It's hard for a 14 year old to come up to this kind of image mm -hmm. if it is not because they saw it. This is what they saw. This is the violence they escaped from. The recurrency of showing the way in which drug cartels deal with people who cannot pay ransom or who do not want to work with them. The people are killed, they are cut into pieces, the pieces of human remains are put into acid or given to dogs for eating. These are stories that the kids 
continue to say through their art. Uh, and there are some other stories we did not ever hear before, which we learned through this mural project, which is that many of these boys, all younger than 18, were already fathers. And they talk about how deliberately they wanted to become fathers because they felt that the possibility for them to become 21 or even be older than 21 was very, very narrow. They all felt that they would be killed before age 21. So they wanted to have a child as a way to leave behind a memory of who they were. The mural, especially this being so large, has many, many wonderful vignettes and layers and opportunities here. They are talking about how they feel it is wonderful to imagine that they could travel the world to tell their story, that their story was valuable. And this is one of the last uh, images of this mural, which to me summarizes what this mural is about, which is second chances. They all felt that they deserve a second chance in life. And especially one Salvadorian artist, age 14, said, you know, I wasn't born bad. And I don't think I am a bad person. I really think I need a second chance. I deserve a second chance. I'm only 14. And the answer is yes, you do deserve a second chance. So this part of the mural talks about how they see their life as uh, you know, the metaphor of the jigsaw puzzle. Some pieces fit well with one another, some do not. And um, it's hard to put the pieces together, but it is possible. And they arrive here with open hands. They have nothing except themselves, but they're really hoping for something better to happen. They don't understand the criminal justice system. And once again, let's consider the legal ramifications of these minors who are in a maximum security prison. The minute they are 18, they're being sent to another maximum security prison for adults. And we will lose them from there because who is going to claim you know, to know for them. I mean, that, that is for me one of, the, um, one of the most important messages that I would like to bring with these murals. I have been able to get these murals out of the criminal justice system. They have traveled, they have gone to universities, uh, within universities to schools of law. One of these murals is, it has been exhibited during this year at Harvard Law School. And the reason why I'm seeking that kind of connection between the mural and lawyers, especially young lawyers, is to ask them to please consider to do pro bono work on behalf of these kids. As I said early, the story of these undocumented minors is not sufficiently known in the United States. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really incredible example of the power and beauty of the art. Um, we are having some questions now from our audience. And uh, as much as I would like to go on with this conversation, and I hope that we are going to have a chance to have this live next year in Belgrade for all for you yeah. to <laughs> so for our festival next year, next year, hopefully, we have like about 10 minutes or a little bit more to address a few questions that we got from the audience. So I will read them. So first one is for Claudia. So hello, Claudia, wonderful work. I love the notion of being invited by community. How do you deal with the possibility of re-traumatizing communities you work with? Mm -hmm. Well, that is a great question. And um, I think that one of the, mm, one of, of the reasons for which we have been very careful not to intersect communities without being invited is because we feel very strongly and it has been reinforced work, project after project that is very important for the community to first want to work with us. 
So we, we wait until they are ready. And sometimes this takes a long time. I mean, sometimes it takes years, literally it takes years until the community finally um, you know, finds that it is a good moment. So in terms of the process of re-traumatizing, I think there's, uh, there's always a possibility that that will happen. And in fact, I think it does happen especially in the first day. Most frequently, what happens in the first day is that we share where we are coming from. The, you know, we are, for instance, visiting the community in Guatemala and they, they are all survivors of massacres. They talk about their experiences. The chicas talk about what it means to have been themselves. Um, people who are survivors of massacres in El Salvador, I talk about Argentina. That first day is always very sad. And most frequently than not, we cry together. Now, what happens after, which is part of what I think community art projects are for, is uh, as Cynthia was saying, there's something very joyous and very mysterious about building something that doesn't exist and we are doing it. And quite frankly, painting together is really fun. So we all start with the understanding that we are sharing a profound uh, pain. So in regards to the question that is being produced, I, I think there is a process of re-traumatizing re -traumatizing through the memory, but then there's something else. And that something else is what the mural project is about. And I can talk a lot more, but I wanna be, um, leave time for other questions. But thank you for the question. Thanks a lot. So another question could go to any of you. Um, I love the notion of finding the common ground between conflicting sides. Could speakers please share some more examples of projects where people from conflicting sides were safely brought together? I would like to respond and talk about a project that I've had the honor of participating in here in what we call Turtle Island, what's more commonly known as the United States. And it's around, it's between the Nez Perce and the Nimipu people, one of the federally recognized nations of indigenous peoples in this country, and the United States Army and the community living in Vancouver, Washington. And it started out rather inauspiciously as the uh, mayor of Fort Vancouver wanting to invite the Indians to dance for a celebration. And of course, many American Indian peoples don't feel like there was much to celebrate, but they moved away from that into a deeper dialogue and said, how could we come together in a good way? What, what do we want to explore together? And um, the Nez Perce, the Nimipu people said, we want to explore the history of your incarceration of Red Heart's Band during the War of 1877. Because in many indigenous time cosmologies, the past, the present, and the future coexist. They're not linear and, and they can be brought to life and addressed um, at any stage of the time. They said this, although it may sound to you, the mayor and the United States Army, this happened a long time ago. For us, it's still very present. So they came together and they started a series of, of rituals and ceremonies. And I'll just, and I, I'm constantly, with being careful of time, I'll just describe one of them. It's the annual Red Heart Memorial Ceremony that brings together the Nez Perce, the United States Army and people living there. And they have um, ceremonies that celebrate their reconnection with each other through the restoration of the way of the horse. At the end of the war, the United States Army killed eight to 9,000 of the beautiful Appaloosa horses that the Nez Perce held. And for the Nez Perce and for many of us, they're the great horse nation, they are relatives. For the United States Army, they were weapons. And Chief Joseph, before he died, asked for this to be restored. Rather than the land, he asked to restore the way of the horse. And people here didn't get around to responding to that until generations later. But now through these annual ceremonies and through um, people's agency and relationships that are built through those ceremonies, they have restored this way of the horse. One of the, the descendants of one of the adjuncts to the general in that war found the best Appaloosa stallion that they could and gave it back to descendants of Chief Joseph. Other people have donated so that the
the Nez Perce people can come there. You can you can find images of this. Or I'm happy to share images later if anyone would like to see of the times I've been there. Then they're full regalia, singing their traditional songs that they would have sang in 1877. And they're young people understanding what it means to live in respectful relationship with the land, with the Great Horse Nation, and now with descendants of settlers there. So this has been, I think, a very powerful example of how these kinds of arts-based and cultural-based initiatives can address those differences. Thank you for this beautiful example. Um, maybe for Cindy could be the next question. Um, how do we make the environment simultaneously safe, engaging, and thought-provoking? How do we do this without any censorship? Cindy, you're muted. Thanks. Sorry. I, I guess um, I'm not sure if the if the question asker is thinking about workshop spaces or community spaces. But um, I think I, I'm very interested, intrigued by this um, concept of creating brave spaces maybe as opposed to or alongside safe spaces. I mean, the, the question is, how do we create the space, I think, where people who have been part of oppressor communities or perpetrator communities take the brave step of acknowledging harms that they have done? I mean, that can be a first step. And Diana, your work has really focused on that to some degree. Um, I think when I've led workshops, let's say with Palestinian and Israeli children or young people or, and adults, we begin with a commitment that our intention as we speak is not to harm each other. Now, somebody might be hurt by something that someone says, but the intention of the speaker is not to harm. And then with that intention, people are able to say back to someone, what you said just really offended me or what you said just really hurt me. It violated my narrative, my understanding of what, of what the situation was. Um, I'll say um, another specific example of, of working in that particular conflict, which is to we displayed like an array of very powerful photographs, not related to the conflict per se, but asked each participant to choose an image that captured their feelings about the conflict. And then they became very interested in listening to how, what the image meant to each other. So I think the, the challenge, I mean, people come into these situations understandably very defensive. And, um, and, the, and the question is how to reach beneath these defenses in order to create a space for understanding. Um, and the work if it's, if it's an asymmetrical conflict where people have had different kinds of power and different degrees of power, um, the emotional work to be done on each side is, is different. And I think um, that, um, that emotional work needs to be recognized by people who are structuring a sequence of activities and recognizing the different needs on the different sides. Mm -hmm. This is not to say that you know every conflict is is um, susceptible to, to reconciliation or anything like that. I mean, sometimes there's just you know, especially in the case of like that uh, Claudia might talk about between in in the case of state violence against its own people, that's a different situation, and those power dynamics also have to be acknowledged. May I add something to that? I yes. Just, 
Yeah. Um, what is really fascinating, and I'm so thankful for this invitation. I'm learning. This is like going to college for a whole semester in only two hours. So thank you so much. Um, what I think it's different in, in listening to you, Cynthia, about um, you know having workshops and talking about this between Israeli children and Palestinian children. In my experience, concretely, for instance, in the case of El Mosote, 25 years after the massacre had occurred, we were to paint a mural that would commemorate you know, the, the community at, uh, at that moment. And I was not ready for this, but what I confronted is that half of the community wanted to paint the massacre and half of the community refused to accept that the massacre had occurred. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, listen, like this, we cannot work. So you try to figure out how you come across something that you have in common. I am in Perkin, four kilometers north. Call me when you're ready. And it took two, uh, two, two weeks and uh, they finally called me and they have come to the conclusion that they wanted to paint how the community of El Mosote was before the massacre, which by in itself identifies that even the ones who didn't want to talk about the massacre, I, you know, agree on something. What was interesting in this project and also in Colombia with FARC and civilians and also in Northern Ireland is that if the project, this kind of project that we are accustomed to do would have started by producing the possibility that we were going to talk about the conflict, it would have never happened. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it's important for us, and the case of El Mosote was fantastic because it's a huge mural, <laughs> it's a huge mural. So eventually things that did happen during the massacre were portrayed, but they had to come to an agreement. For instance, there's a portrait of the man who is recognized as the one who talked to the army and the army told them, yes, there's gonna be movement in El, Sol in, in El Mosote, but we are not going to touch the civilians. So this man came to the community, Don Ismael Marquez, with total candor said El, El Mosote is going to be respected. Well, ev you know, everyone was killed, including Don Israel Marquez and everyone else. So in a way, when one reads the report, one could be tempted to think all this happened because Don Israel Marquez gave mm -hmm. the wrong message. But the community, both parts, wanted to have the portrait of Israel Marquez because he was he was candorous. He believed what the army said. Now, this is something that as an outsider of the history of the community, I would have never come to even imagine. But I think it is a very important part of how the community can get to talk. That is not a, it's not by inviting them to talk about the conflict. It's about something else. Let's find out what you guys have in common. What, what I can say about this mural and all murals is that uh, with except of one, none of these murals has been defaced. Mm. And, and that is a way of understanding that if it hasn't been defaced is because it still is valuable. Mm -hmm. and bonus questions, for, bonus points for the ones who can figure out where the mural was defaced from all the ones that we have made. The only one that got defaced was in Switzerland. Mm. Wow. <laughs> go, go figure on that, right? Okay, anyway, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. So the last questions I'll summarize because partially you just answered to them. And uh, I think we have a couple of more minutes before finishing this amazing conversation. We can go on and go on, but I think we need to uh, uh, like wrap it up, but so the last question is uh, related to, I'm thinking about time in relation to creating change. Do you think there is a particular timing after an event to make the most of art possibility? And also um, for Cynthia, do you think there should be a space for oppressors and the oppressed which are separated? So sorry to now rush you, but I need like, kind of the brief thoughts on this. Um, 
So, so maybe I should go last and Claudia and Polly can speak briefly and I'll wrap it up. Um, I just want to speak briefly to the question about time. And I'm thinking here uh, of bringing indigenous perspectives of time in together with Western. Um, ab the Aboriginal elders that um, mentored me when I was in Australia for 16 years and indigenous elders here in Turtle Island talk about this concept of, of the everywhere of the past, present, and future being integrated and all being alive. So there, there may be critical times in specific conflicts, but the, in for many of these indigenous elders would say there is no critical time. There's no time at which it's, it's too late to move into it because it's still alive and present. Um, there might be a time when it's too soon, um, you know, that, that people need some time to find those kinds of spaces that Claudia has described. But John Paul Lederach talks about that also. Um, he said he he's one of the, you know, foremost scholars in the world around conflict transformation and had said he nearly got run out of a conference when he suggested that it might take the same amount of time to build a sustainable peace as it did for those particular violences to occur. So if you're looking at, you know, racism or colon, um, coloniality, that we may be looking at you know, generations of work of iterative ongoing cycles. So I think in looking, answering that question, is there a critical time? I think we need to consider all those different aspects of time. Thank you. Uh, would you like to reflect on this, Cynthia? You said you're going to go last or? <laughs> sure, okay. Uh, maybe Claudia has something also, but two things. Um, uh, well, first of all, this question about is there a role for oppressors and oppressed to meet separately? Yes, sometimes there is. I think there are risks involved in that, of just perpetuating the narrative of one, uh, the separate narratives. But I think um, having people come together to, to create, to try to facilitate an openness to hearing the other, to have people... Um, I like to have a space where we can remind people that they are there not necessarily as a representative of their people, but as themselves as individuals and that they have the right to change their attitude and to take a new relationship to their community's narrative, that that doesn't, um, that that's uh, a possibility. And yeah, so that's, I, I mean, I think it's possible, but I do think it's, you know, Obviously, you don't want like, you know, white people in America to get together for the purpose of reinforcing their racist stereotypes. So you have to be careful of those things. About timing, I want to say that I think there's always some possible action, almost always some possible action, but the artist and peace builders have to read the situation and see what's possible at that moment. And maybe it's just finding the, those people in different communities that have the capacity to listen and strengthening them. Or it's, um, I'm thinking about this um, initiative in the US of, of dealing with the legacy of lynching when African-American people were horribly um, captured and hung as it was part of reinforcing the white, re, white racism. And now, now, in this year, in the last couple of years, there are communities that are ready to start acknowledging that yes, there were lynchings in their community. And um, I was uh, happy to accompany an African-American colleague of mine, a musician, Jane Sapp, in, in this multiracial chorus, singing Ain't You Got a Right to the Tree of Life in the context of a ritual, of a ceremony, where everyone was ready to acknowledge the lynching and then could begin to think about reparations and how to move forward. It was the, a moment that the community was ready to have that story acknowledged. So different kinds of work need to be done to create that readiness and to like really make your artwork connect to what the next possible step is. 
Thank you very much. And Claudia, just the last question for you, very quickly. How do communities find out about your work? I guess there is a website. <laughs> well, there is a website which is eternally out of date because we work a lot more than we have time to, to work in the computer. So I'm sorry for that, but it is www.walsofhope.org. How people get to know about us mostly is through under the radar, especially communities that want to work with us in projects is never through the traditional format, is never through, for instance, technology, because they may not have it. It's through word of mouth and phone calls and you meet someone and then someone comes to Perkin or goes to Cincelejo and all that kind of thing. Um, so it's really interesting that our work has been expanding totally under the radar. And, and that is, I think, we didn't think of this at first, but I think what it has done is it has protected the uh, privacy of the people who are part of it. I mean, I, I for instance, do not have uh, a web page of my own talking about these projects mm. because of most of these projects I cannot talk about. And I certainly can give only very partial information because the identity of the people is compromised, their safety is compromised. So our work travels the under the radarness, uh, but that there is that web page which is um, always out of date. But thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. You. Um, okay, so Polly, Cynthia, and Claudia, thank you so much for this meaningful conversation. I would just say a couple of uh, concepts that you mentioned. Uh, during the conversation that would stay with me and they hope with our audience as uh, togetherness. Uh, the question, what can I do? Uh, this amazing image brushes a candle, so I would have to give now double credit. When I <laughs> Art can create space. Art can create space for deep listening and being present for the others. Art engages us in restoring human dignity and also incredible concept of brave spaces versus safe spaces. So many um, uh, topics uh, that could go on, uh, uh, I mean, from all what you said, so, but I think this is incredible contribution to uh, the, our field, to the festival. Thank you so much. And also to the world, definitely. Thank you and have a wonderful rest of your Sunday. And uh, the theater continues with its um, art and human rights festival. Tonight, uh, we have incredible concerts by a Roma um, band, and they will be uh, playing uh, amazing Roma music and speaking about Roma culture. So it will be very celebratory tonight. And uh, I'll be thinking about all three of you. Thank, Thank you. you. One more. Thank, Thank you so, so much. much for inviting us, Diana. Thank you. Thank you for yeah. all your work, Diana, over so many years and for this festival and for letting us be part of it. Thanks. Thank it's you. the labor of love of the whole Doc Theater team. Amazing. <laughs> Golden team. So. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Polly. Bye, Claudia. Bye, Cynthia. Bye. Polly. Mm. Ciao, ciao. <laughs> Until next year in Belgrade. <laughs> Next year in Belgrade, definitely. Bye. Ciao, ciao.